Thank you so much, Sudhi. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are doing great. I hope you all can hear me and see me clearly as well. Thank you so much for joining us for this masterclass where we interact with the winners of the Great Place to Innovate Award and hear from them as to what are they doing, what are how are they looking at innovation as a whole. Uh, so without any further ado, let's quickly deep dive into the first session where I invite our first speaker for today's masterclass. Uh, for the first discussion, we have Uday Prabhu, Chief Innovation Officer, Bosch Global Software Technologies. Uday is responsible for innovation culture, new product introduction, technology in innovation, and strategic portfolio definition across Bosch India. He has over 30 years of experience in the industry. And on a personal note, he's a runner, a hobby carpenter, a keen macro photographer with the hashtag MyDailyPhotoRuns, and an amateur guitar player. Uday, welcome to the virtual guys. <clears throat> hey, good morning, Rishab. Yeah. Thank you so much, Uday, for joining in. Um, before we even get started and deep dive into the programs and the mindset of how Bosch has evolved into becoming an organization which is fostering innovation, I would like to understand from you, how do you define innovation at Bosch? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> uh, happy to be here. Um, so for us, uh, innovation is a tool, right? Um, a mechanism uh, primarily to uh, secure our long-term competitiveness, right? As with every, every organization, you need to ensure that you are uh, relevant you know, in the years to come. Um, uh, it is also about how do we prepare our organization uh, mentally uh, to be able to uh, you know, understand technology, understand the changes in technology, and to be well prepared for it uh, you know, in the days and years to come. So it's all about uh, you know, getting the organization ready uh, and also getting the people uh, ready uh, so that they are competitive, uh, knowledgeable, and uh, you know, at the forefront of uh, you know, the ch changes that are happening so rapidly these days. Well, I think uh, you touched upon an important aspect there, right? That uh, for any organization or for, for you at Bosch, you're, you're using innovation mm -hmm. to stay uh, relevant for the years to come. Uh, building on the same line, right? The, the concept of innovation, the innovation narrative as we speak, has changed for GCCs in the past five to 10 years significantly with more and more adopt, uh, organizations adopting innovation mandates from for just from uh, if I were to speak of 2010 to 2020, we have seen um, 3.5x increase in the overall startup programs that are being run, four times increase in terms of the overall internal programs that are being run, two times increase in the overall academia partnerships that are being run. Bosch was one of the first movers in this space in India, uh, almost over a decade now. How has your intent for innovation evolved over the past few years as an organization with the fact that you called out of staying relevant. So how has your intent evolved over the years? Yeah. Um, as with every uh, uh, no, uh, captive or a GCC, as you call it, uh, you all start with uh, uh, no, serving uh, uh, the uh, needs of the global organization. Right. You start with services. And your innovation mandate uh, is always around how do you improve your engineering efficiency, right? It's all about how do you get faster and stronger and uh, cheaper and, and, and things like that. Um, as we progress, uh, the knowledge base uh, increases. Right? You start to gain more knowledge of the domain. You start to get more confident in handling global customers. And with that knowledge, uh, you, know, you start to uh, believe that you can do more, right? And so what we have done is we have uh, you know, invested in, in that uh, you know, competence, invested in that uh, knowledge and the domain, and started taking on greater responsibilities, which go from you know, just running programs to owning programs, right? Then owning roadmaps and owning uh, you know, customer uh, you know, visions, right? And with that, uh, we've also uh, become stronger in being able to invest uh, into horizons, right? Uh, beyond the first uh, no, one and two years, investing into further horizons uh, of, we typically call it as horizons one, two, and three, right? Going from core investments to adjacent and uh, beyond investments. So that uh, evolution of uh, looking beyond uh, today uh, happened as the confidence and the capability grew. Um, I think 
it, it's extremely important uh, on a point that you touched upon that uh, whenever we are looking at innovation and as we speak of the evolution mm-hmm. of a program that it undergoes, mm-hmm. it, you need to look at not just from running a particular program to that of you know, owning a particular program. You need to look beyond the, the core um, offerings that you have to adjacent and tapping into new markets that could be there. Now, uh, in, in the program that you're running, uh, what we learned that in addition to emphasizing ideas aligned with your core offerings, uh, you also proactively pursue adjacent and new markets, which you just now called out, right? So uh, many of the GCCs today are faced with this, uh, face this challenge of um, identifying use case mapping for these ideas, which enables them to uh, work on a particular idea or just to select an idea and then prioritize. How do you really approach the process of use case mapping to ensure that you're moving in this direction of um, you know, core offerings, adjacents, and beyond? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, so for us, uh, it is about uh, uh, being well networked uh, in the entire ecosystems of technology and domain, right? Uh, what is what is going on in, in technology? You know, what is going on in academia? What is going on in the you know, research institutions? What is going on in the startup world, right? Uh, simultaneously, we look at what uh, what are the uh, you know, OEMs up to? You know, what are the companies up to? What are the you know, movements that are happening out there? Uh, we also put, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, what we call as ambassadors uh, who are located in different aspects. And they are keenly looking at uh, what are the product uh, you know, roadmaps. And then we create this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this map of uh, what we call as an impact uh, matrix, where we look at uh, what is the uh, maturity of these technologies. We call it as a technology readiness level versus uh, what do those technologies uh, impact, right? And then, so we have now this uh, 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 no, uh, great amount of information about products, their roadmaps, technology uh, readiness, uh, uh, innovations and inventions are going on at the uh, no, universities and research centers. And then we put together a matrix of uh, which are the potential uh, technologies that could impact a certain uh, no, product line or which could create a new product line. And so then we have this uh, mechanism of uh, how do we uh, give it a weightage uh, in terms of uh, what we typically call as uh, you know, wait and watch, uh, put some investments, or uh, do some uh, you know, small uh, you know, proof of you know, concepts. So we have different mechanisms of uh, mm-hmm. uh, investing in different technologies uh, based on the maturity levels and what we see in the industry. And then we keep you know, progressing uh, in quick uh, sprints to make sure that uh, no, uh, we have a uh, no, uh, roadmap, a proof of concept, and a business uh, buy-in as well. So this uh, this complex uh, view into what everything is going on in this world, uh, giving it an assessment of uh, you know, maturity and impact, and then uh, placing your bets uh, based on these weightages you know, help us to keep this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, hamster wheel running. All right, so- um, is that the fundamental um, thought process that you have or the basic assessment that you do? Because um, you, there's a smart investing rule, right? That we should not put all our eggs in, in a single basket. And you just now touched upon that there's a lot of framework, there's a lot of thought process that is goes, that there's a lot of assessment that's being done. And more importantly, weightage that has been assigned in terms of what needs to be picked up. Uh, what is it something that you want to place your bets on? <clears throat> something that you want to wait and watch? Um, and... For, for a GCC today to succeed, it's important for us to run, run those multi-pronged approach where we are looking at programs, we're looking at innovation across startups, across internal, across academia innovations, right? So uh, along with the aspect that you just now called out, wherein you are looking at various parameters um, in terms of figuring out which probably lever to work with, which, pro- uh, which is the uh, aspect or the innovation mandate that you want to move forward. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to touch upon in terms of how can a GCC or an organization for that matter can reduce, can you know minimize their risk and maximize their returns in terms of running these different innovation mandates, you know, together? In yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a problem of uh, plenty, right? Especially in uh, today's world, you know, so many technologies are maturing at the same time. Uh, you really are uh, uh, wondering... Uh, which one to uh, no, bank upon. Uh, but uh, uh, what we do uh, here is uh, we have a, a well-defined portfolio, right? 
so we have market segments and we have portfolios technology portfolios um, so we today have around 8 to 9 uh, portfolio topics and then we all always look at how these portfolios impact uh, business right and within these portfolios you know we have all these uh, uh, you know uh, uh, matrices of uh, technology and impact and all that stuff and within these portfolios we uh, you know hypothesize on uh, use cases and against those use cases uh, you know we look at the business benefits the desirability conduct a lot of interviews and surveys uh, and based on that we arrive at our short list of uh, investment uh, you know, topics right and this is uh, evaluated on a, on a quarterly or a half yearly basis based on how the progression is right and simultaneously we also look at you uh, know whether it is a make or buy decision right yeah. or should we uh, look at investing versus you uh, know uh, uh, no, or collaborating so uh, uh, the focus on portfolio based investment uh, helps us to you know keep our uh, uh, you know uh, uh, say conversations on track you know and uh, focused and not be uh, sort of uh, uh, surprised or shocked by so many things happening right so we have a clear roadmap clear portfolio we work on this portfolio even to add a new topic into the portfolio uh, requires us to conduct multiple uh, conversations and validate so this uh, you know portfolio focused approach helps us to keep our you know eyes on the road but i think that, i think you touched upon a extremely important topic um, that is also a challenge that a lot of organization face in terms of quickly evaluating that decision whether it needs to be paid versus buy and um, the fact that you talked about that um, as an organization you have uh, well defined portfolios where you analyze a lot of things where you analyze um, the market where you analyze the portfolios builds upon that uh, backs that decision quickly in terms of enhancing what's the innovation mandate that um, you would want to probably move forward with and i think that's an excellent insight for our listeners as well that uh, this is this is a very common challenge that most organization face of um, having a well defined analysis being done as to what's happening in the market that needs to be um, reviewed every quarter every half yearly and not really making it a yearly practice would just go a long way to enable uh, organizations to make that decisions more effectively now uh, in in the similar lines right where we talk about this multi prong approach where we talk about um, the outcomes that we look at from each of the programs that we are running and making that decision as to which particular uh, lever or which particular uh, direction we should move into uh, a major problem that we have also seen that uh, a lot of gcs face is in, is not in terms of maybe starting is not even in terms of how they would want to probably look at the things right the major problem uh, challenge that we have seen gcs face is in terms of phasing a particular program right in terms of how they would want to uh, look at milestones maybe for each of the different programs across sectors across mandates that they are running um, any insight that you would want to share in terms of how should how are you probably analyzing different phases of your programs uh, uh -huh. that can become a right. great thing right i mean we are a, a, a german organization so we have uh, you know uh, amazing amount of uh, you know processes right and uh, you know we have a, a very strong uh, bosch innovation framework that works on multiple uh, you know uh, innovation gates right and these are very well uh, structured and uh, we push our innovators to follow it uh, you know we start with uh, assessing the desirability quotient of the entire uh, you know, topic uh, does the user want uh, does the user want it and does the business want it right so these two questions have to be mandatorily asked before you even put uh, you know any uh, money into uh, building anything right so we spend a lot of time uh, you know validating this uh, scenario of uh, what does the user want and whether business is aligned to it so now you have a need and you have a sponsor right so once these two are uh, uh, finalized uh, i think a lot uh, uh, you know moves forward because then you have the uh, 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 simple aspect of uh, a buyer and a seller right sorted out right now you can go into the technical aspects of it and the business aspects of it right so uh, like, uh, similarly we have multiple such you uh, know gates you know desirability uh, aspect uh, viability aspect and the feasibility aspect uh, broken down into multiple uh, gates and this allows us to uh, ensure that 
we do not uh, spend too much time and too much money uh, on topics unless they are uh, well validated right and uh, uh, this helps us to uh, spread our investment funds across a, a larger number of topics uh, 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 no uh, whereas earlier uh, used to focus on building the product first and then figuring it out uh, no who's going to buy it right and we quickly realized that uh, no uh, maybe i should have waited maybe the you know the user actually wanted this but i ended up doing this so all those challenges are now sorted and so it allows us to uh, you know validate multiple ideas and then invest into a strong validated uh, you know desirable uh, you know uh, finalists right so that's how we uh, go about uh, spreading our uh, uh, gates and uh, you know reviews something that you talked about in terms of validating <clears throat> these ideas to ensure that you quickly map uh, is this an idea that's worth investing the amount of time money mm-hmm. in terms of building it and is this really what a customer wants um can you can you probably just touch upon a little more in terms of do you have like a proper uh, a timeline that you follow uh, uh, an assessment that needs to be done in terms of why do you think those ideas because um what what we eventually see is there there are a lot of ideas that come up from um individuals from associates from members and a lot of those ideas in the beginning seem to have that potential even after we have that first quality check that's been done um so from the uh, aspect or the journey where they, that particular idea has already been looked at as a as a good idea as a potential idea to that of analyzing is that really an idea that can be pursued forward uh, can you just talk us a little bit about yeah. that journey as well absolutely Uh, so if you look at from a idea point of view uh, you know ideas are plenty ideas are great uh, but we give it an element of uh, uh, you know magnitude time and frequency right uh, you know as good engineers uh, you know is the idea scalable right can this idea uh, convert into a product that millions of people will want right so you look at it from a scale point of view uh, second uh, we look at it from is this idea solving the problem of many people right and so we give it a uh, you know time and frequency is this a problem that somebody faced uh, uh, you know uh, uh, once and it has never repeated again uh, is it a problem that it is that is a regular occurrence right and that people will pay to help uh, this problem to go away right uh, or is it something that happened to the idea uh, you know uh, originator and but nobody else is facing it so we look at it from all these angles of uh, how this idea can actually benefit a uh, uh, scalable uh, population uh, can benefit uh, that the problem has a lot of uh, pain and therefore needs uh, solving and then the uh, uh, and the idea has uh, sorry the problem has pain and is worth solving and the idea has gain that uh, people are uh, ready to pay for right and so we look at it from these angles and that helps us to uh, you know give a reality check uh, to that particular idea right so if the idea is great uh, it helps solve problems of many uh, it uh, helps the problem that uh, it a big uh, big uh, chunk of uh, the headache uh, goes away uh, multiple people are facing it and they are ready to pay for it uh, then you have all the uh, you know uh, uh, kpis of uh, a good idea right uh, it will uh, the desirability is there many people want it uh, feasibility is there the you know, technical guys are ready to build it and the business uh, viability is there many people are ready to buy it right so we look at it from multiple such uh, things and we force the innovators to go and verify this in the field you know good engineers are uh, are good at engineering but they hate going out and you know talking to people so we force them you know or can you talk to 100 people 200 people can you verify if this problem really exists right and then can you go and check if you build this idea are they ready to pay for it Uh, so this constant conversation with the market the user and the business helps the idea to uh, you know flourish or uh, uh, you know realization that okay maybe I, could, i need to tweak this a little bit more i think that's that's a fantastic input um, in terms of uh, constantly having that interaction between um, your customers between the customers between the market and the internal teams and more importantly the parameters that you called out in terms of magnitude time frequency that enables you to make those decisions in terms of scale in terms of the problem of how many the frequency of how regularly is that problem occurring i think Absolutely. that's an important insight in terms of evaluating the ideas that are looking good to ideas that you would want to work upon uh, 
in terms of building that particular aspect right uh in in the res- in the responses and uh, the details that you've highlighted you also indicated that you have received a significant increase in terms of the associates uh, participating in the different innovation programs that you're running mm-hmm. so how have you been able to achieve this particular increase in participation how has that impacted your bottom funnel any insights that you want yeah. to share i mean that falls directly in our realm of you know culture right how do you uh, increase the uh, cultural aspects uh, of the organization to always think innovation always look at how can i do my job uh, you know better faster cheaper stronger you know on a daily basis and so we have multiple uh, firstly we have a very large organization and uh, it's difficult for a central team to do it all so we have created a network of ambassadors you know we have uh, innovation ambassadors who are spread across the organization and each one is tasked with you know uh, taking care of his you uh, know uh, no posse of uh, people uh, uh, then we also have built uh, uh, what we call as communities and tribes right these are uh, uh, you know uh, tribes who are passionate about a certain topic so we have uh, you know tribes around uh, uh, you know high compute we have tribes around uh, augmented reality we have tribes around uh, robotics and uh, these tribes are quite uh, uh, you know are given a lot of uh, freedom to build whatever they want uh, based on what they see in the organization uh, what they see outside the organization and we give them uh, you know funds to also build that so you now you have thriving communities who are uh, you know uh, fascinated with uh, that particular topic and once that tribe uh, starts getting fascinated you throw problem statements at them right can you guys uh, solve this problem right can you guys solve this problem and suddenly you have excited engineers enthusiastic engineers and you have fed them uh, uh, you know a problem to solve and that gets uh, you know solved like kind of crazy uh, we also uh, uh, from the cto organization we proactively conduct workshops right uh, see uh, engineers are great at solving problems but what problem to solve is what we uh, facilitate right so because we are looking at the market we're looking at the clients we're looking at the road maps we know what are the problems that uh, need uh, solving uh, you know which needs innovation so we uh, we create those uh, problem statements we articulate it uh, we create guardrails around it and then we uh, uh, conduct design thinking workshops proactively you know taking a business division in conducting these workshops and and then everybody's focus is on this particular problem to solve right uh, so a uh, focused innovation Uh, a lot of homework before you you know come to that workshop a lot of preparation about the problem statement right uh, helps uh, these uh, things to uh, you know um, say have more people uh, you know attack it so on one side you need to uh, create uh, enthusiasm on the other side you need to do your homework on what problems to give these enthusiastic uh, teams and with that uh, you know we create uh, this uh, you know uh, flourishing of uh, you know ideas and that helps a lot uh, in the organization i think um, one of the aspects that you talked about mm-hmm. so having more folks that you're doing at bosh right having a network of ambassadors communities and tribes that are in turn fostering and uh, uh, an important aspect that you touched upon is to have innovation as a culture uh, but here is a classic challenge that most gcc space when they are starting to sow the seeds of driving those innovation mandates is mal- is managing that balance when they are starting off right in terms of building innovation as a culture or uh, doing in or thinking of innovation on a day to day basis uh, and also ensuring that uh, your capacity uh, your capabilities uh, associates are still able to deliver their you know their regular deliverables enhancements the requests that they are getting from customers right so there's that classic challenge in terms of the trade off because maybe there's a starting off in that direction right so how do you really move from forward from that particular challenge to thinking of innovation on a day to day basis and not really uh, a process thinking of innovation as a making innovation as a habit yeah so i think the culture part is a tough one uh, to uh, solve uh, you know in a short period of time it requires constant you uh, know and a persistent uh, attempt at you know building these communities Uh, building communities is a tough job you know how do you feed these communities how do you keep the you know communities excited uh, we have centers of excellence how do we make those centers of excellence uh, well networked uh, you know, worldwide into academia into research into you know uh, into analyst pools uh, uh, how do we build uh, uh, relationships with the business side uh, to get the right you know problem statements 
And of course, uh, the uh, major problem of it all is how do we get these talented folks to focus on executing that idea, right? When they are much in demand to you know, uh, execute regular uh, deliverables, right? Uh, so we have uh, built a fund around it uh, where uh, uh, we also have programs like uh, what we call as innovation uh, sabbatical where people can sort of uh, take a break uh, from their regular uh, work, come and work on the innovation product uh, topic for uh, you know, three to six months and then go back to uh, their regular uh, delivery responsibilities. So we have all these initiatives which uh, help people to you know, have a, a tunnel vision, focus exclusively on that particular topic, uh, take it to a certain uh, level of uh, maturity and then uh, you know, go back uh, to their regular thing. Uh, on that, we also take the help of uh, you know, uh, external organization startups to build that uh, flexible execution layer, right? Whereas the regular team is busy with uh, uh, you know, their regular duties, we take external help for the you know, uh, uh, execution side of things uh, so that we don't have to always uh, push the existing organization uh, to deliver. So all these initiatives help us to have more ideas uh, you know, being executed and more ideas coming to a maturity uh, without impacting regular uh, you know, uh, uh, organizational deliverables. Uh, I, I really like the aspect of what you said about the innovation sabbatical, uh, giving individuals that space to think and innovate and come back and uh, continue their journey, and along with how uh, collaborating with startups to get that uh, you know deliverable out, to get that work still moving in tandem, and making sure that that collaboration with startup, which is another engagement in itself, is also helping you drive internal innovation. So uh, riding like, you know, two bikes at a time, as they say, to have a collaboration with external ecosystem, driving more internal innovation mandate. I think that's a beautiful point and an extremely uh, insightful takeaway for our members to look at, to not just look at all of these three approaches as we talked earlier, as well as different parallel approaches, but see how can you still make uh, some sort of synergies out of the same. Uh, most of these organizations, most of the organizations when they're starting off, right, they end up looking at you know hackathons and ideathons ideations as a starting point for innovation which as as innovation 101 uh, which is which is still a good starting point but how should the the real challenge that lies is in terms of establishing a robust pipeline uh, and effectively scaling the most innovative ideas right and i think that's something that you uh, are doing extremely well in terms of uh, multiple aspects of having that culture having uh, an innovation sabbatical being brought in, uh, evaluating the ideas quickly that can go in a long way. So I think these are some excellent you know, insights for our members to build upon because we received a couple of questions already on the similar lines. And that's why I thought I, I'll probably stress the insights that we got from you. Now, another aspect that you want to probably hear from you in terms of um, uh, something on the similar lines in terms of innovation that we look at, uh, there are three major aspects on which um, Typically, innovation uh, is being looked upon uh, with the insights that we were able to generate from the work that you're doing, right? Which is innovation at a people level, process level, and technology level. Mm -hmm. How are you going about these three aspects as a whole? Right. So uh, I think people, we talked about, uh, you know, how do we build culture? How do we you know, uh, incentivize them? How do we uh, you know, uh, create enthusiasm? And how do we feed that energy uh, so that it is sustainable? And then how do we direct that enthusiasm uh, towards a focused uh, no problem statement, mm -hmm. right? That's on the people point of view. In parallel, uh, in the process point of view, I talked about how we are doing a lot of homework uh, to identify the right use cases and problem statements that can be fed to this uh, no, team. <clears throat> so we have the centers of excellence, and then we have a vibrant uh, no, startup uh, engagement uh, where, uh, no, um, uh, so if you look at it from a startup uh, engagement and why do we uh, no, engage there, uh, uh, we have what we call as a, a competency or a learning curve uh, aspect. We have a time aspect and we have a cost aspect, right? Uh, if I have competency and my learning curve is short, then I will uh, do this particular topic uh, myself, right? If my competency is weak and my learning curve is going to be higher, which will therefore translate to more time and cost, then I will look for startups who are already in this and the technology maturity has progressed uh, no, uh, further. So that helps us to uh, you know, uh, take our bets on whether we uh, do it internally or you know, uh, no bank on startups. And from a technology point of view, we have this technology radar team 
were always looking at what's going on, whom should we collaborate with, whom should we tie up with, whom should we speak to, whom should we invite uh, to you know, raise our uh, you know, capabilities. Right? So uh, all these uh, you know, people process technology go hand in hand uh, you know, and they are all uh, working in, uh, uh, in tandem so that uh, you know, all those topics then dovetail into one uh, uh, you know, uh, into the group of enthusiastic engineers who can then take a stab at it uh, to uh, execute. Uh, so I think all of them are, have their own challenges and uh, processes and and uh, networks, right? Each one is a different network, right? And we, we work on those networks to keep them well-oiled and functional. Well, I think... Uh... An excellent insight in terms of how do we make sure that we make use of all of these three aspects, people, process, and technology, and work in tandem, work in parallel in terms of uh, work in synergies in terms of ensuring that all of that becomes a part for bigger picture that we are looking at and helping innovate in our organizations. Now, we have been speaking a lot in terms of the importance and the need to innovate. Uh, why should one, what are the various ways to overcome the classic challenges and the typical problems? specific problems that a lot of organizations face. Uh, what I would like to hear from you is, while there is a definite need to innovate, while we should move forward in this direction, uh, what are the potential risks or barriers that come in when we look at innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the risks are uh, plenty and uh, no one has to always uh, no, look out for it, especially when you are uh, trying to innovate uh, one has to always uh, realize that we have a running business uh, you know, ongoing, right? Uh, so uh, there has to be a lot of attention to ensure that the businesses are not uh, impacted, right? There's no conflict of interest or you're not introducing a technology too soon, right? On a thriving uh, business, right? Because everything has a, a lifespan. Everything has to be thought about in terms of when to introduce it. And so you cannot, uh, you know, uh, sort of sabotage a running uh, you know, operation. Uh, and so therefore, uh, our team has to constantly uh, look out on, uh, uh, you know, uh, establishing the right uh, methods of uh, addressing, uh, say, clients, right? Uh, so we have this uh, mechanism of uh, uh, what we call as key accounts, where uh, you don't accidentally go into a, a, a customer and establish parallel uh, threads, right? So we have, uh, you know, every, everyone goes through the common uh, you know, uh, key accounts. And uh, so that if there is an idea, it goes through the uh, you know, key account team who will analyze this uh, for uh, you know, any risks and then present it uh, to the customer. Um, from a, a people point of view, you know, we have running businesses that need to be uh, you know, executed. And everybody wants to innovate because it's a you know, cool thing to do. So how do you make sure that uh, you not sabotage the existing delivery business, but yeah. you uh, know spend time on this. So that's how do you keep that uh, separate through those uh, you know, innovation sabbaticals or uh, tribes and you know, uh, keep the uh, things uh, separate. Uh, you also have the challenge that uh, you, uh, uh, you innovate, but you miss out on key technical aspects or uh, you know, security aspects or uh, intellectual property or open source. Because today the information uh, glut is so much that uh, the uh, uh, no, uh, the uh, desire to take this idea from this uh, open source, then put it together and then try to sell and not uh, look at it from licensing and uh, no, IP and things like that. So that's an area, but we have uh, teams and we have anyway, uh, rigorous gates as I talked to you about, which will look into uh, all these aspects. So uh, most of the risks are related to IP infringement uh, open source, uh, you know, conversion to commercial, uh, conflict of interest uh, from businesses and things like that. So uh, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of like uh, uh, gates where all these are checked, uh, you know, uh, scrutinized uh, before it moves uh, into uh, you know, a well-defined product. So yeah, that's what. So I think that's, a, that's an important um, element for any organization to have is to maintain that balance between the need to innovate uh, the method to innovate, the approach to innovate, and also ensuring that the current business that you are running, exactly. uh, the that balance needs to be there. Uh, you cannot have anything over the expense of another uh, crack, if I can call it that way. Another, uh, another certain <clears throat> barrier, and this is something that we even received as a question uh, from our listeners as well, in terms of 
uh, balance, uh, you know, barriers and challenges that they see that they face eventually is in terms of um, having that innovation bias that comes in as you know engineers are probably approaching. It could be getting trapped in in a solution space or uh, how to avoid that being the first mover in the space as a barrier. How should engineers uh, probably enable and drive those customer meetings, yeah. interviews when the, when they're not aware of you know uh, sales, when they're not aware of the, tr- the trends that are coming in? How do we avoid that barrier that an engineering team might be facing and getting stuck in that loop of innovation as getting stuck in a solution or building a product or um, you right, know, right. Space. Yeah, I think this is a very important question. Uh, you know, engineers to uh, love to work on the technology part of it, right? And uh, you know, they're like, oh, I'm doing something cool, and that has to be encouraged, right? Um, it's also not uh, uh, right all the time to force engineers to go and do things which they are uncomfortable with. You now, do user surveys and all that stuff. Uh, so what we have done is we have created a team that will support, right? So we have created multiple support teams. For example, we created a team that helps to build the business model and the ROI aspects of it. We have created another team that helps with uh, you know, user desirability uh, you know, surveys and 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 looking at how do I build uh, 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 a desirability quotient and uh, not validate uh, this particular thing. We've also tied up with external organizations who provide these services. So for example, if I want to do a, a dipstick survey on say 500 people in a certain uh, segment, there are organizations that we have tied up with who will uh, do it for us. Uh, we prepare the questionnaires, we prepare the uh, you know, sequence and the process of which uh, the interviews have to happen and we pass it off to them. So the key thing is about enablement of these engineers, right? So you focus on what you're doing, uh, but uh, you know, uh, these needs to be done will help you do it. So we mentor it and we uh, make them part of the program. So the next time around, they'll realize that, okay, this was really cool. Next time, let me do it myself. Let me try doing this before you know, working on the technology. Uh, so that's how we uh, know, enable the teams to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, you know, the important aspects of the business side and the user side are not ignored. I think that's a that's a <clears throat> insight in terms of in, ensuring that we are enabling our teams. We are collaborating with as many stakeholders, as many support teams as possible to to give that belief to the teams that they are not alone in this journey, that everyone is working yeah. together. And you're bringing in right sort of collaboration with external, you know, ecosystem partners, startups, different team members internal to act as a perfect, uh, you know, pieces of the puzzle, just forming together and, you know, giving out this that wonderful picture. Um, we, we have spoken a lot on the innovation aspect, right? One thing that I would, uh, on what has happened, what's currently happening, my final question to you there would be, um, according to you, what's the next big this next big thing in this entire space of innovation, if if at all that's something that you can touch upon? I mean, there are a lot of big things happening these days, uh, right? <clears throat> the I think the current flavor of the month is uh, you know uh, uh, AI, uh, generative AI, conversational AI, and and, and whatnot. I think the next big innovation is how do we harness this uh, effectively? Right. Uh, right now, it is it is on the hype cycle. Everybody's uh, you know it's like uh, uh, engineers in a candy shop. Everybody wants the candy. It's it's so many varieties of candies, and and the question is how do you uh, uh, not be uh, sort of uh, thrown away by the uh, technology progress, but how do you consciously create programs that look at how do I uh, harness this effectively, right? As GCCs, I think the first major uh, uh, responsibility for us is how do we improve on the engineering excellence, right? So we start with that. You know? We have engineering excellence. We have software development excellence. Uh, uh, you know, how do we bring out and execute and deliver uh, you know, cool products? So how do we uh, then take this technology and say, where do we insert this into our current life cycle? How do we uh, modify our tool chains to incorporate this uh, you know, technologies? How do we bring up the knowledge base of these engineers on these you know, technologies in an effective manner, right? And uh, so that uh, becomes uh, uh, the uh, current, uh, uh, when I think all of us are trying to do that. I think that's the current uh, innovation, I would call it the inflection point uh, right now uh, where 
<clears throat> the technologies are so powerful. Uh, uh, so the organization need to be very, very clear, uh, very well organized to be able to harness this uh, you know, energy, right? I think the next innovation will come in the space of how do we harness this energy towards uh, you know, engineering excellence. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Uday. Uh, with that, we come towards an end for the discussion, uh, for the different insights and the questions that we had for you. What a wonderful discussion we have had uh, where you have talked us through so many insights, where you have given us so many takeaways in terms of how do we think innovation as a part of our culture? How do we get in multiple support system, be it on internal teams, ind individuals, associates, startup ecosystem, external collaboration for that matter, to not just get the work going, but also look at collaborations as a, as a building block for innovation to happen in parallel. Um, how do we have different evaluation matrix in place in terms of stage gates, in terms of quick evaluating all the programs and the phases of the different programs having you know the the aspect of magnitude time frequencies to evaluate the ideas from that of a initial stage to that of the idea that can probably move forward and more importantly looking at innovation and building innovation as a culture which will take time but but we definitely need to start thank you so much today for these wonderful Thanks. insights i've just been able to cover a few of the many insights that you gave away the takeaway um, it was thank it was really an absolute privilege to have you Thanks so much. Uh, I think it's a great time uh, to be an innovator. Uh, you know, so many things happening, and I believe uh, you know, everyone should uh, you know, take this uh, uh, beast of uh, you know, technology changes uh, head on and uh, you know, domesticate it uh, to your uh, respective you know, usages. Thanks for having me. It uh, was a pleasure. Always uh, you know, ready to talk about uh, innovation. Thank you so much, Uday. Once again, many congratulations to you and Boris for winning the Great Place to Innovate Award for the program. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you so much for taking time out to speak to us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.